morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. I'm President Tony Monaco, and it's my privilege to welcome you all virtually to the first Tisch College event of 2021. We are honored to be joined today by Tufts alumna Jen O'Malley Dillon, class of 1998 and proud member of the Jumbo softball team. We gather with Jen and with our moderator, Dean Alan Solomon, at a challenging time for our nation. We remain in the throes of an awful uncontrolled pandemic, and I know many of you have experienced loss. My thoughts of comfort and support are with you and your families at this difficult time. And then just one week ago, we all watched with shock an assault on our democracy as an armed and unruly mob displaying the symbols of white supremacy attacked the United States Capitol. These despicable actions go against everything our democracy, our rule of law, and our own values at Tufts represent. Public service is the lifeblood of our university, as our guest tonight clearly demonstrates, and truth is one of our fundamental values. Next week, we will witness something that perhaps we took for granted, the peaceful transfer of power in our democratic republic. As President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris are sworn in. And so I can think of no better guest to welcome on this day and no better moderator to lead us through this conversation. Jen O'Malley Dilling most recently served as campaign manager for the Biden-Harris campaign, which made her the first female campaign manager of a successful Democratic presidential campaign. She has dedicated her entire career to public service via politics. A field organizer at heart, she is a veteran of seven presidential campaigns. In 2012, she served as deputy campaign manager for President Obama's reelection campaign, where she oversaw the largest field, education, political outreach, and data analytics organization in the history of presidential campaigns. Before she joined the Biden campaign last March, Jen served as Beta O'Rourke's campaign manager in his race for the 2020 Democratic nomination. And next, Jen will continue her career in public service as a senior member of the Biden-Harris administration after the inauguration. Moderating today is the Dean of the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life, Alan Solomon. Throughout his career, Alan has embraced the power of social activism, civic engagement, and public service to benefit society and promote the common good. His life has been marked by service to the country and to this university. Alan was appointed by President Obama to serve as United States Ambassador to Spain and Andorra from 2009 to 2013. Before his posting in Madrid, Alan chaired the board of the Corporation for National and Community Service, the home of domestic service programs such as AmeriCorps, VISTA, and Senior Corps. He has also served as National Finance Chair of the Democratic National Committee and is a veteran of six presidential campaigns. I am greatly looking forward to this conversation as I know you all are. And with that, I gladly turn the event over to our esteemed moderator, Dean Allen Solomon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for those very generous, that very generous introduction and for all that you do uh, to support civic engagement uh, at Tufts and beyond. I want to, by the way, thank the political science department and the Tufts softball team for co-sponsoring uh, this afternoon's event. And Jan, I want to welcome you back to Tufts and to Tisch College and to congratulate you for managing Joe Biden's victorious presidential campaign. I know I speak for the entire Tufts community when I say that we're enormously proud to call you a jumbo. Now, I was going to wear my Biden mask, but, I was a, but this is a nonpartisan event, so I'm going to dispense with that. Um, and we certainly want to talk about the campaign and your reflections on last week's events, the work ahead for Biden-Harris administration. But if we may, let's start with your own journey. One of your legacies as an undergraduate was that you were quite a softball player. In fact, you were captain of the softball team. 
But maybe you can tell us more about your experience as an undergraduate at Tufts and what led you to a career in politics. Hey, Ellen, and it's so good to be here with you. And you look very good in that mask. Um, <laughs> and I am so excited, first of all, just to be here with Tufts and Tufts softball, um, which we will talk a lot about, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, I um, I just think these types of series are, are so amazing. You have had such wonderful speakers. So it's, I'm an honor. I'm honored to, to be here and with all of you. And I will tell you, um, I would not be where I am today, not the fact that I'm in my attic, um, but that I'm doing what I'm doing without Tufts. Um, and, you know, I think most people could say that their time uh, in college had a real impact on, on their lives. And I certainly... Um, feel that way about my life. Um, you know, I, I would think of three things in particular when I think about my time at Tufts um, that had such an impact with me that I carry that forward to today. The first are my friends um, that I made at Tufts. My closest friends are still um, the the friends I have from playing tough softball and my room, my freshman year college roommate who all still live around Tufts. Um, and they, we don't see each other as much, especially during COVID. Um, but they have helped me uh, navigate my life, uh, and and we would not uh, we have not have made it through if we didn't meet together at Tufts. Um, the second is, you know, Tufts was the. I always knew I wanted to be involved in politics in some way. I don't know that I knew necessarily what that meant, but Tufts allowed me the opportunity to volunteer on a local campaign. Um, I interned at a congressional office. Um, and and I, I really found, uh, you know, a space within my career at Tufts to um, get my feet wet on campaigns. And, and I, I was able to be part from the Tufts Democrats at the time, organize a trip to New Hampshire um, during the presidential election uh, a long time ago. Uh, and it was, you know, sort of uh, sparked my interest in a way that I really um, learned about what it was like to be on campaigns, but that I actually could do that as a job, like people did that. Um, and, and so that really came because I had that opportunity. And the the last piece, and I would say most important piece that has shaped my life has is tough softball. And, you know, I know academics um, matter a great deal. Softball mattered a great deal more to me than academics, I will say. Um, and I, uh, you know, was able to um, be part of this tremendous team um, and, and, you know, one of the things that we said on the campaign this time around uh, was that we could do hard things. It was kind of the mantra we came back to. Well, that mantra came from my softball coach at Tufts um, while I played because we were connecting, you know, as I was, I was starting this new job. So it's hard to um, uh, put into words the power and the impact of this experience has been on not just my time then and developing myself in terms of, you know, what I want to do in my life, but the person I am and the, the ability I've had to, to take this, this journey that I've had that has been pretty wild. Well, um, you're an inspiration to everybody, and it just shows you what the va value is of a well-rounded Tufts education. Um, I did want to mention at the outset that um, you've drawn a bigger audience than any of our speakers so far, even bigger than uh, Pete Buttigieg. So if you happen to bump into Pete, you know, around the West Wing, if he shows up, tell him that you had a bigger audience at Tufts than he did. He was actually one of our first speakers first semester. So, um, and speaking of campaigns, you came to campus last January to participate in a campaign school that Tisch College ran. Beto O'Rourke's presidential campaign, which you had been managed, managing, had come to an end. And you and I talked about what you might do next. We even discussed your teaching a course at Tufts. What happened next and what drew you to the Biden campaign, which at the time wasn't exactly setting the world on fire? Well, you know, I, I remember that time fondly and it was freezing, honestly, uh, when I was there. Um, and it was sort of right before the world's kind of shut down uh, to some extent. Um, but, you know, at, at that time, as you know, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. We just moved our family to Texas to work in the campaign and we were moving back. Um, and I was tired. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I wasn't sure uh, what next step that I wanted to take. And, um, you know, the president-elect reached out to me. And, and the reason, you know, what I ended up doing um, was actually go to Nevada for him uh, to be a volunteer and help. Um, and the reason I did that 
was because uh, I, I believed fundamentally that he was a good man and, and, and a great leader and someone that I thought should be president. And, you know, I, I really felt like even though it wasn't clear what was going to happen in the primaries, I had an opportunity to help. I had time. Um, I wasn't sure if I could commit to a longer um, uh, arrangement working for him at that moment because of um, uh, some personal family stuff. And so I, I really just want to get out there and, and support him. And, and I felt like, um, you know, uh, he certainly as we started moving into this place, um, where we were seeing what was happening in China at that time um, and we're coming to terms, you know, a little bit late, but with what was going on with, with COVID, uh, you know, as I look back on that, it's hard to imagine another leader that could, first of all, garner 81 million votes and build that broad coalition, but could be ready for on day one, the multiple crises that this country faces. Um, and so I'm so grateful that my um, uncertainty ended up with the opportunity to work for him and to take on this role. Um, but, you know, more grateful that he is the person that's going to lead us forward because, um, you know, we, we have so much work to do. And, and he really, from day one, e even early in the primary, sort of cemented on, um, you know, what this country needed, a battle for the soul of the nation. And, and that's what he built the, his whole campaign around. And by the way, the offer to teach at Tufts still stands. We can defer it for a few years, okay? I, I, they would be an honor. I, I, I don't know that I would be much, uh, much of a teacher, but I would I, love to do that. I don't know about that. In any event, um, before we talk about the work going forward, let's talk about the work of the campaign, because you stepped into the role of Biden's campaign manager in midstream. What was required to build a campaign organization that could deliver the presidency, what was required of the candidate, and what was the strategy for getting to 271 electoral votes? Yeah, you know, I think it's always obviously hard to come in midstream, but one of the things about campaigns is that when you're coming through a primary, that's a very different type of campaign than when you're running in a general election. Um, so no matter what, we were going to be building to scale. Um, your strategy is different in, in a primary. You're going state to state through the early windows from caucuses to the primaries. Um, in a general election, you're obviously building a map to 270 electoral votes. And so I, I you know, obviously um, knew that I had the opportunity to, to be part of something that had already been built, a great foundation. Uh, and so I felt fortunate that I, I had the ability to come on and, and join the team. But it was definitely a challenge. And it was a challenge not because, it, certainly doing this transition and building to scale against an incumbent president is always tough. Um, working through that transition from a primary where you have to replenish your coffers, you're building your team, you're building a new strategy, you're you know, ha reaching out to a broader electorate, those things are like foundationally difficult that are just part of how to um, think about the general election. But my first day on the job, I had my first meeting in Philly in our office. Uh, I introduced myself, um, you know, uh, told people how much I love Peloton and that I played softball and the things that I, I you know, think about that are not political. Um, and then at the end of that meeting, we had to say, and starting tomorrow, everyone has to work remotely on the campaign. And we never worked in person again. And we didn't know that, obviously, at the time. And so the added challenge for, for me as the manager coming in and for the campaign itself was that we had to go through this transformation into running against um, a sitting incumbent uh, during a pandemic without ever having the opportunity to meet each other in many instances, to work together, and to have the tools that we would rely on traditionally for a campaign. So, you know, all of that's hard. I, I would say what made it a lot easier was the president-elect was always clear from the beginning that safety came first. And that, you know, he would not, um, you know, uh, build a campaign based on the way it's supposed to be or the way it was before, if, if it put anyone in harm's way. And having a, a leader in, in the president-elect to, to really set the tone, to set the tone that we were going to be a role model, that he was a role model, to make sure that uh, he was doing all he can for, for people to wear masks and social distance and, and all the things that we've all gone through in that journey, really gave me the flexibility um, you know, to, to understand that we can navigate this transition together. But it, it, was, it was quite a challenge for all of us. And when you looked at the map, I mean, you had the, the old blue wall that had 
cracked a bit in 2016, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, but I know you always had your eye on Arizona, so it must have been especially gratifying to you. Tell us a little bit about, you know, the puzzle that, that is the, the electoral map and what you were thinking in terms of the way forward for Joe Biden. Absolutely. So the first thing that we um, tried to do was make sure that we could build an expanded pathway to 270 electoral votes. You did not want to be, we did not want to be in a situation where um, we had to rely on only the blue wall, only the, the Michigans, Pennsylvanias, and Wisconsin, and that was our only path to 270. We wanted to have multiple pathways. We wanted to make sure that we were expanding our map to give us as many opportunities as possible. We have a, oh. Oh, there we go. I lost you all for a minute. Oh, okay. Can you hear me still? I can see you. All right, great. Um, we wanted to make sure we were giving as many people as possible uh, the opportunity to be part of the campaign and create those pathways to, to 270 electoral votes. And we really thought that there was from the very beginning an opportunity to bring new, new states into play, which included Arizona, which I would say from the beginning, I was incredibly bullish on. Um, Georgia, obviously, lots to talk about with Georgia. Um, but we also saw, you know, Nebraska too, that one electoral vote. There was a pathway that just included that. So how do we um, build up an operation there? But our, uh, fundamentally, what we thought was really critical was to make sure that we were not just reaching one type of voter or building a map that just included outreach or programming to one audience that we knew to be successful in this environment. We really had to build an expanded map, but we had to make sure that we were building customized state campaigns in each of these states um, to make them as competitive as possible and to make sure that we um, kept as many states as possible on the map as long as possible. And I think that's what we did. Obviously, a number of states that were tight were really swing states that we didn't end up getting at the end of the day. But I do believe that this race changed the map for the future uh, and changed the map for what we're going to be looking like uh, in 2024, which, uh, to be honest, was not the case for the last 20 years. We sort of had that, that one map that we've all kind of operated around. Um, and, and now we can really expand upon that, which I'm excited about. Well, and you certainly went after every type of voter, but I would want to talk about one type of voter, <laughs> believe it or not, but that's young people, because yes. as you know, Tisch College studies the political participation of young people were the leading source of data and knowledge about their role in elections. I think it's pretty well documented both by us and others that young people played a huge role in Biden's victory, especially in key states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia. But he was roundly rejected by young voters in the primary. So how did you turn that around? How important do you think young people were to the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? Well, I think that young people were incredibly important to our success. Um, and, and, you know, we're an incredibly important part of um, not just our voters, but also our volunteers and our, our campaign and our operation. You know, and I think we had this incredibly uh, amazing field of candidates in the primary. And that gave us the opportunity, every one of us, to really take a look at um, all these amazing candidates and really, um, you know, suit up with different people. Um, and when it came to the general election, you saw uh, a really um, very fast um, consolidation of support behind the president-elect, faster than anyone anticipated. If you remember back at that time, you know, there was a bit of a hangover from 2016. Is the party going to align? Will people get behind whoever the nominee is? Um, and we were able to do that very, very quickly, even in the throes of the early days of the pandemic with Senator Sanders endorsing us um, very early on, uh, Senator Warner, uh, Warren, and, and, and we really were able to, I think, build this coalition of support that is 100% about certainly who the president-elect is and the, the contrast that he was to Trump. And it was also about what was at stake. This was a referendum on Donald Trump. We had to be clear what we stood for and what we were going to fight for. Um, but I think that we were able to speak to, to all ages and all backgrounds, um, you know, it, and I'll talk on, on young people, but seniors, uh, an audience that typically is very strongly Republican, 
uh, moving heavily in our direction. Uh, and that was really solidified uh, in the sense that Donald Trump wasn't getting the job done. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people that can argue um, a lot of the, the moral failings, uh, you know, of, of the president. But fundamentally, this race was about whether or not he was doing the job of president and he was tackling the, the crises that we were in. Uh, and people just didn't feel like he was doing that. And COVID kind of overhung all the, the major attributes that we looked at. Um, and with young people, I think that it was both um, uh, a look at what this country could be uh, and also a, a belief, uh, I, I hope and I believe that the issues that um, the president-elect was speaking to were issues that they care about. Um, you know, while uh, he is someone that, um, you know, maybe wasn't seen as uh, the, the, the candidate uh, like Senator Warren, a little bit more progressive, he is going to be the president with the most progressive agenda in the history of our country, tackling the issues that are going to matter, not just for the future, but for today. And I think that that spoke to young people. But I also think young people know that they can't wait that you know they don't they don't they don't have to wait their turn to have a voice and be able to to lead and we saw that time and time again in this campaign and that's been a real change i think i think i think young people are beginning to understand like they never have before or like no generation has before that their vote really matters and uh and hopefully that will that will bring good things for our democracy um the pandemic changed everything in terms of how you run a campaign um, and you certainly um, wa wa hit, 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 hit this tidal wave of difference. Um, I mean, you're known as, as an expert in field, and, and here you had to conduct field work entirely differently. Um, how do you think the lessons learned in 2020 will change the way campaigns are conducted in the future? I think that's a great, I mean, we could do a whole session just on that. You know, um, I would say a few things. There's there are things that change, but the, the essence of campaigning stay the same. And the essence is that you're trying to reach people, you're trying to make a connection with them, you're trying to find common ground, and you're trying to um, make clear that the American people have a voice in this process and that the power of their vote is one of the most powerful and profound things that they have. That's their voice when it comes to the electoral process. And so we talk often as operatives about, you know, the bells and whistles that come with how we organize and the tactics we use. But at its core, it's about building connection and creating a, a bridge to people and doing it in a way that's as much what we want to say as it is listening and hearing and engaging where people are coming from. And I think that we were able to navigate this new world and still keep that as our, our North Star. Um, so it really kind of changed a few fundamental things. First of all, um, you know, in, in the early days, uh, as we were closing out the primary and we were moving into the general election, um, the spring and the summer, you know, we had we had primaries. We, we didn't have need people to vote. We were, you know, had a field program that we were engaging with people. But instead of communicating with them to say, OK, you know, we're in this election. Do you support us? We need you to go do this thing. We actually changed the way we talked and we um, we actually talked to them about how they were doing. So instead of putting hard ass in front of them, because everyone was going through this, you know, time where we we're all home and our lives had blown up, um, we were just trying to meet them in that moment to say, we're here, we know you must be going through a hard time, so are we, you know, we want to stay connected, now's not the time to, to push hard on this stuff, but we're here, you know, can we help in any way? And so, you know, that's kind of unheard of when you think of campaigning, because time is your greatest asset, and to go and and not make those hard asks, um, you know, was was a tough call, but it was a it was a right call, and it really paid out with our hypothesis that if we built that foundation, we could come back to it when things had solidified, when we got closer to the election, and we would have already some type of connection. I think certainly the other piece um, that's much discussed is so much of our work is done in person. You know, you often say you come for the candidate, but you stay for the experience. You stay for the people that you meet, the staff that you meet, the volunteers. So we try to recreate that community uh, online uh, in ways that, frankly, people were missing in their own lives. Um, and, and doing that through how we organize, obviously creating opportunities through Zoom, um, finding ways to connect, and then, you know, using heavily um, uh, digital-driven engagement. But we also, the last thing I'd say is, 
you know, we, um, we actually found phones, phone calls worked, you know, God forbid we go back to some of the old tactics, but people were picking up the phone. I know having been stuck in the house with my family for months on end, I was happy to talk to somebody else. So, you know, we, we really tried everything, but we didn't lose the essence of what we were trying to do and, and that engagement. Um, and I do think there's a lot to, to learn from that to really kind of simplify and drill down with how do you how do you build an opportunity to have real connection and and the quality of what you're trying to do, not just the quality and the volume of your attempts to reach people, but the quality of that engagement. Now, I think you also proved the value of listening to people. Yeah. Uh, it took a long time for the results of the election to be called. Uh, it felt like the entire country was holding its breath, waiting for the results. Uh, along with the campaign's lawyer, Bob Bauer, you held regular Zoom calls for, for supporters and others. What was that period like for, for you and the campaign? And were you always confident that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris would emerge as the winners? Um, I was, um, but you know, I would have liked to have done it a little bit differently. Uh, I will be honest. Um, you know, that was a really tough time for everyone. And, and, and I would say, you know, we were so well prepared. We knew that anything could happen. Um, and, and we, we had every possible legal scenario and organizational scenario ready to go. Um, but at the same time, we also knew that it was going to be a struggle for this country because of the way and the ordering of the results coming in. And, you know, we tried to do as much as we could to level set coming into the election, first to say the race was far closer than the public polling was saying, and that this was going to be far tighter, uh, and people needed to know that, and we needed everyone because it's going to be close. Second, to make clear the order of how it was going to go and remind people how it typically goes. So obviously we had a whole conversation about, you know, vote by mail and, um, and you know, how often that's coming in after the election, which is the standard, but people don't really know that. They weren't paying attention to it before. But the fact that we were going to have places like Florida and North Carolina and Georgia that we thought would come in far earlier than the blue wall states. And the blue wall states, the Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, were always our likeliest path to 270. So even though we talked about having that expanded map and we thought a lot was in play, the likeliest path, the path we were most focused on was always going to be the blue wall. And those three states were the ones that were going to take the longest because of the way the vote was coming in and how they would count it. So while we tried to prepare everyone for that, it didn't change the fact that it was very hard as you started to see states like Florida that of course we wanted to win Florida. Nobody would say that we didn't, but we knew that was going to be a much, much harder state and we knew that would come in early. Um, but we had, we knew that we just had to go the long haul. So we tried in that period to over communicate. That's why Bob and I um, coming to you live from Wilmington um, just really tried to share what was going on, but also to make sure we were getting the facts out. We had a very, very, very good team that knew exactly what was going on. You know, I was obviously waiting to see the results on election night. One of the hardest parts for us is while we could see the numbers coming in, we couldn't tell what type of uh, method of voting those numbers were coming through. And for the first time ever, the, the dramatic difference, the partisan divide by method of voting was you know, so impactful for us to model out where we would end up. So as we were getting these numbers, yes, we were seeing 30% come in, we're seeing these counties come in. We knew what we wanted to be in these counties, but we didn't actually know the order of their counting. And so it became a little bit harder for us to know exactly what was going on. But we knew very, very late on election night into the morning um, that we were gonna be okay. That was tighter than, than people had expected. But I will say, uh, you know, it was very early in the morning, let's say five, six o'clock in the morning. Um, we did a, you know, we were checking in every two hours with our team, what's going on, what do we have? And that's when we knew for sure we had it. And that without a doubt, and that it was just gonna take time to ride it out. And, and then we wanted to just keep communicating, but it was, um, it was, it was a harrowing <laughs> time. So, so you modeled it? You didn't follow the magic wall on CNN? That's not how you... Well, yeah. I mean, look, to be honest with you, some of that stuff is, is pretty good too. But what it doesn't do is project out in where we needed to go. And, you know, our folks were so good. Becca Siegel, um, you know, she headed up our, our data and analytics uh, operation. And, um, you know, she and her team 
not, they just, they knew what we needed to get to and, and were within points, within thousands of votes. We knew when we were in the Arizona and the Georgia situation, how tight it was going to be, but they were looking at it that closely that we, we just had confidence um, that it was just about riding out the process. When you came to campus last year, it was last year about this time, so maybe yeah. we could have an annual visit. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. done. January, January with General Mally Dillon, okay? <laughs> but when you came to, to the campaign school last year, you, you spoke very candidly about the struggles that women and especially moms face in high stress positions like in the political campaigns or in the White House. Your message was quite honest and powerful and it bears repeating. Uh, so while I want to acknowledge that a man in your position would not likely be asked this, how do you balance being a spouse and a daughter and a sister and especially a mom in such a demanding position as you've had? And what advice do you have for the young women who are with us today? So I love this question. I'm always happy to ask, be asked this question and speak to it. And I, I, I say that because I actually think it's really important that people know I am a mom. And that doesn't mean to say that you, you have to be a mom to do this, but there are not, um, you know, we, we as a society, as a country, don't create uh, opportunities or supports to uh, even be able to see a mom and a good mom and a professional leader as a woman uh, in enough ways. Um, and I just don't feel like um, we're going to get there unless people like me and other moms that lead are given the opportunity to do it, um, are honest about how, you know, my white privilege and the privilege of my life and my husband, who I, the only reason I can do this is because I have a partner that has gone above and beyond to support me in this and, um, you know, and the other support that I have. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that I am better at what I do because I'm a mom. Um, but I, I wanna be honest too, I just don't think you can have it all. I, I would say all the time I'm of the RBG school um, of thought here, which is yes, you can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. And so there's real sacrifice here. You know, um, My son is not happy that I put him to bed and he is two and he's obsessed with his dad and I am like, not good enough. And, you know, that's a bummer, but I am doing this work and I don't, you know, I, I get it. At the same time, one of the, I, you know, maybe it's a blessing. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to, to say it that way. But one of the things that we were able to do on the campaign because we were living in COVID and because um, like many people, my kids were in school in the room next to me. So they're often popping in here and could care less what I'm doing and who I'm talking to. Um, but we every week we would do uh, staff meetings. And so, you know, it started with 100, 150 people. It grew to, you know, 4,000 by the end. And I, I, I normally would not do as many all staff meetings in that big group. We did it every week to kind of create this home base, especially because of COVID, because, you know, we had people everywhere, people, young kids, like back home living with their parents, people with their kids. So how do we create that connection? But in those Zooms, when I would be scrolling through the people that were on there, you saw kids and dads with babies and dogs and, you know, you saw life and, and you saw like, you know, meetings you're in with kids screaming and you just powered through uh, and kids sitting next to you doing homework. And, and it was men too. And, and I, and it, and it might not just be kids. It, we, we had so many people that were taking care of, um, you know, family members and, and elders. And so I think it kind of broke this idea that you, you shouldn't miss, mix those two things, or it's not professional to have your kids around um, because we were forced in that environment. And so my hope is that as we go forward, um, you know, we're, we're more accepting and more open and more flexible. And I, I know that it's possible because as I look to my new role and, and as we go into the White House, um, you know, I was worried about um, how to juggle this with my kids. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out, though, because um, Joe Biden is is so supportive of this. And, and this is one of my favorite Joe Biden stories to tell. So at the very early days of the campaign, back when I wasn't sure what I was going to do, um, in addition to not being sure whether I could do another campaign, you know, my dad had just found out he had cancer. We weren't sure how sick he was. So I was juggling a lot. Um, and, and so I said to the, the president-elect, I said, I, I just don't know if I can make this work, you know, with family, and I don't know if I can give you all that you need. And he said that for him, 
the number one rule is to make sure his staff take care of the needs that they have and their family and that he would be more upset if I didn't take an opportunity to do something for my kids or, or have bedtime um, that I carve out than if I always went to meetings and ignored that. And that that was always a rule he had. And that's amazing. I mean, I, I've worked for a very long time in this business and to have someone say that, you know, like him in the beginning, I mean, that is in part why I took this job. And it's in part why I've had faith and comfort to say, you know what, I, I actually will not work between um, 6 and 8.30, 6.30 and, and 8.30, unless it's really critical, because that's my only time with my kids. That's when I try to put them to bed, even though Kevin has no interest in me doing that. And so I read a book or two. Um, and, and that people work around that. And that's that's what we have to do to change the system. But also, um, I just think it's it's just so important to talk about this stuff and make it make it normal. And I do think we've changed that a little bit because we were forced to. But I see real opportunity on the horizon for, for more families and more women and more moms. And the water is warm, gals. So come on in and join us um, because we need you. That's a great message. Thank you. And and by the way, we we, we got to meet your folks, you know, on, on Boston television. So oh, God. I've not even seen that yet. Oh, God. Really? Well, Alison King did, I think, I don't know, I think it was an NBC 10 um, uh, show and they interviewed both your folks. They were delightful. They're very proud. I think your dad was wearing a Biden hat, if I can remember correctly. In fact, I, we we taped this session, so maybe maybe we'll send it to them and, and uh, send it to, to your folks. They were obviously very proud of their daughter. Um, well, I'll I'll just say just on that. You know, I do this for a living and we don't, you know, we we often would say, you know, don't talk to press, let's make sure you talk to the campaign or whatever. <laughs> and so in the family text chain that we use every single day for all of us to stay connected, my mom's like, oh, your dad is being interviewed on the front lawn. And I was like, what is happening? And then she got interviewed anyway, that that it was it was wonderful, but I'm a little nervous to see it myself. Well, tell them that some people saw it, some Tufts people saw it and loved it. I will, I will. I'm afraid we can't avoid talking about the events of last week. I'm afraid we have to deal with the events of last week. We, you know, we awoke to the news that Georgia had elected two Democrats to the United States Senate, and we went to sleep wondering about the future of this country and its democracy. In your opinion, what does the Biden-Harris administration have to do to restore civility and trust and sanity to national politics? And where do we go from here? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there's no easy answers here. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm here speaking in my own capacity on this. But I, I, I would say, um, you know, I couldn't imagine a better leader to be able to be a contrast to what we've seen. I think, you know, just number one, we have to be reminded um, what it's like to, to see a president um, who's doing the job, who, um, you know, is, is someone that can, can carry us through crisis. I think often on the campaign, we were in this situation where the president-elect was both running for president and also speaking as president at the same time, you know, where there was just that void of leadership. Um, you know, and, and as, you know, I said from the beginning, he, he always had a clear sense of why he was in this race. And, and um, this battle for the soul of the nation and what that meant to him and, and this belief that this country needed um, to come together, but also healing, uh, and that we had to uh, really understand that. And you know, often um, he would speak even in the primary about the importance of, of bipartisanship and, and trying and working together. Uh, and I think that that's really gonna matter as we move forward. I think this country does not believe that we can come together. We are so polarized as an electorate we are almost, someone said yesterday to me, it's like we have two different realities. Uh, and we saw that in, in play last week. And I think that there are, you know, there is, so the president-elect's leadership is, is number one in how we, we rebuild trust and hope and a path forward and unify and heal. But, but there's, there's another path forward that we all have a responsibility, I believe in, which is on our shoulders in our own lives. You know, and something I've really reflected a bunch about over the last um, couple months, um, 
you know, is this idea, uh, and I know for all of us, like our holidays, you know, you normally have Thanksgiving with family, all of that kind of got thrown up in, in the air. I, I wasn't able to come home um, for the holidays myself. Um, and so I have more time to think, less crazy uh, family members in my head. But, you know, this idea, right, we all say, oh, don't bring up politics and religion, right, uh -uh, at, at Thanksgiving dinner because you don't want to fight and, you know, whatever. Well, I think that's so wrong. And I think that's not the reason we had what happened last week, but we don't have those kind of conversations. And because of that, we aren't actually seeing or hearing each other. President-elect Biden says all the time that the greatest part of leadership is listening, right? And you already spoke to that. Um, so how can you listen if, if you can't see each other, you can't find a way to hear each other and, and see their point of view? And, and that's hard. I mean, it's hard for me, it's hard for everyone. But I think we've broken down even the idea of trying. And you have that compounded by social media and the way we get our information. You know, we talk a lot about how we're all talking to ourselves, people like us, we're getting information that maps to what we think. Um, but that means we've created silos in this country that really become very hard to break through. And, and then you see this kind of spillover in the national stage where we knew our democracy was at stake. I, that is why I got into this race in the first place. That's why I, I did whatever I could. I know so many people feel that same way as does the president elect. I never imagined, even though I imagined that there was no bottom, I never imagined I would see what transpired last week. Um, and I, I hope it is a wake up call for this country, but I also hope that the answer is not somebody else is gonna fix it for us or that it's gonna be fixed alone by our elected officials. It actually can't be done that way. It really has to be a cultural shift and a responsibility we all take. And it's not like big, heavy stuff. Like we don't have to sit and like philosophize about you know the, the abstract of politics. It's about trying to find out where uh, where the pain is, where the the purpose is, what what's going on in your life? Why why are you fearing you know this outcome? Why are you worried about someone that doesn't look like you? Why are you not engaged in politics and say you just don't care about that? I think there's a lot of that that young people in particular can be the bridge both to their own you know age, but also to other generations to to really kind of force us to to have these conversations and and start that healing uh, and that engagement. Uh, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. And if I can add an editorial comment, I sent you the results of our post-election survey of young people. The numbers of young people who are engaged in talking to other young people about politics is really, is really encouraging. And I think the other thing I would say is we don't, we don't teach young people about democracy and about politics and about civics. And I'm hoping one of the things we pay more attention to going forward is the importance of, you know, discussing these issues in the classroom. Yeah. And that's where people learn to talk to one another. And, and it's not something we're born with. It's a, it, you, have to, you have to be taught or learn and practice. So um, that's another thing that, that some of my colleagues here at Tisch pay, pay a lot of attention to. But we're going to now open this up to, um, to audience questions. But we're going to begin with, um, with, with, uh, with a couple of questions from three special guests who are members of the Tufts softball team. Um, I want to say hello to, to Emma Della Volpe, by the oh. way. <laughs> um, and Ella, Emma Jacobson and Regan Coleman. They're members of the softball team and they have a couple of questions for you, Jen. Awesome. Hi, guys. Hi, Jen. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, I'm Emma. I'm a sophomore studying civil engineering on the softball team. I'm from Washington, D.C. And on behalf of the team, we wanted to say how proud we are of you and how amazing it's been to watch you this campaign season. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to my teammates to ask you a few questions. Hi, Jen. My name is Regan Coleman, and I'm a senior on the softball team. I'm majoring in international relations. And my question for you is, how have your experiences from tough softball shaped your career and how you navigate such a male-dominated field? <laughs> So first of all, I love that Tough Softball sponsored this, and I obviously love Tough Softball, and I think that um, women athletes are like some of the best humans in the land and are the leaders that this country needs. So I and I also 
sympathize for anyone in athletics that has gone through COVID and to be a senior and, you know, God knows what's happening with the season. So, um, you know, I, I know that's far harder than what I had to navigate. Um, you know, look, I, I think what softball and sports in general taught me um, that I've always really carried is that it's not just about me, right? Like, you know, we, we talk about this a lot. Uh, and I think this is sort of for anything you do in life. If, um, you know, I'm successful, it's only because my teammates are successful. It's only because the other people on my campaign are successful. Um, you know, we, we had a meeting just a week ago and we were talking about, um, you know, the, the crisis this country is in and whether it's climate or it's what's going on with COVID and vaccine distribution. And the point that I was trying to make in that conversation was it was all interconnected that it wasn't enough that one team is successful or we have this really great policy or our data is so sophisticated that we know exactly what's happening. That doesn't matter if it doesn't actually connect to what people need and how to get it to them and that how we can reach them so that they're bought into the solution. And I think that that sense that being on a team, uh, I am only as good as the rest of the team it, is really kind of fundamental. And I'm always looking for opportunities to be on teams. You know, I think the other thing is that, um, you know, everyone has a role and that's, you know, it's this sort of the flip of what I was just saying. You know, my job isn't to do everything, even as a campaign manager. Um, and I really had to understand what my role was and what everyone else's role was and how do we create the opportunity for people to flourish in those roles and for them to fit together. You know, how do you find efficiency? How do you make sure that um, you're able to go for the long haul? You're not just making a, a short term um, decision, but you're thinking about what you need to do down the line. You know, can you keep having the pitcher pitch? You know, are, are we all right with an injury or do we need to wait for, for the, you know, some, some extra time for, for healing before playing? So uh, all of those pieces really um, drive me. But the last piece that I would say is um, I think to be uh, an athlete and to balance being an athlete and to be in a school like Tufts, um, requires a lot of balance, but also uh, growing confidence in yourself that if you put in the time and if you put in the work, you can get the job done. And, and the success of that is not measured by winning or losing alone. And, you know, I, I'm, and I'm in a business of winning and losing. And I, while we've just won, that's amazing. I've lost a lot too. And those losses, as you guys know, have so much more impact sometimes than wins. But how do you define your success and how do you build for those successes, knowing um, that you're measured by the work that you put in. And, and while politics is often um, seen as, I think, a field like you got to know somebody to get in and it's about who you know and um, you know where you come from, I just think that's total BS. I am in this business because you know, I was a kid and found a path on a campaign that I really enjoyed. And then I worked my ass off for years and I just put my head down and did the work. And I was willing to take responsibility, take on leadership, take on more work. Uh, and that's how I feel about sports. You know, I was never the best at the beginning uh, and I was never the best at the end, but I worked really hard and, and really understood my role. And, I, and that's really where I found success. And I think that that's sort of the lesson that I carry in my life. And it, it certainly is grounded in, in what I did on the team. Thank you. And do we have another uh, question? Go ahead, Emma. Emma yeah. um, my name's Emma. I'm also a senior on the softball team. I'm studying political science. And the second question we had for you was, what um, inspired you to ultimately say yes to the job? Um, and then what was the hardest obstacle you faced throughout the campaign? Oh, those are big questions. I also have that shirt. That's one of my faves. Um, and I, I have a Tufts jacket that you guys um, sent and I run with it all the time. And I, I actually, it's cold in the attic. So I wear it. Uh, I've done a few meetings with the president elect and he's like, why are you wearing that coat? I'm like, cause I'm a Tufts jumbo. Um, but that's a separate thing. You know, I would say, um, you know, one of the hardest things about the campaign itself, um, and this is like obvious when I say it, but, you know, we were trying to win an election, but we were also trying to keep everyone safe. And I've never had that responsibility of the health and safety of our team uh, and of our candidate and of the people that we are interacting with. And, you know, we're, we weren't the government. We didn't have, uh, you know, the kind of apparatus to figure out testing protocols and, you know, how do you execute on, on even finding PPE and what the hell is PPE to begin with? I mean, we all know it now, but, you know, all those things we actually had to do in this environment that um, really changed 
almost every decision that I had to make because I, I wasn't just choosing what was the thing that was going to get us most um, the most votes. It was how do we rethink this environment we're in, but how do we ensure people stay safe? And that did mean we had to make some changes. It did mean we weren't able to do all the things we would traditionally do. Um, and I'm so proud of the team that we built and the fact that we were able to put in these protocols um, and, and make sure we were taking care of everyone. And that had the added benefit of being a role model um, in a way that I think helped when we had uh, the alternative that we were running against. And, and I think that it was hard um, to even imagine that that would be part of the role, um, but also the most, one of the more re re you know, rewarding parts of, of what we were able to do as a team. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jumbo Softball. <laughs> uh, I think we have a question from an alum. Uh, is Jeff Stewart? Maybe not. All right. I'm going to go to Arna for the next question. Go ahead. Hi. Thank, thank you so much for being with us. It's really been a pleasure to watch you repping Jumbos this entire campaign season. Um, I'm Arnav. I'm a freshman studying economics and international relations from the DC area in the School of Arts and Sciences. And um, so my question was this. So um, while, while President-elect Biden did win, ultimately, I know that many have said that more progressive policies that especially younger people supported, such as defund the police, harmed, harmed down ballot elections, such as the congressional elections. I was wondering what your take on this from like the campaign point of view is, because I know there's a lot of different opinions here. Yeah, you know, look, I think, um, first of all, you have to think of the context of the campaign that we were in. I mean, Donald Trump spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars trying to caricature the president-elect and the party. Uh, and and did that in any way he could. I mean, his whole message at the convention, I think their their theme and was that he was a Trojan horse of the liberal left, right? I mean, that they had a strategy. Um, and you know, while they weren't as disciplined in their strategy in the summer, when they changed their campaign manager, um, they got more disciplined, not from a Donald Trump standpoint. I mean, he was always sort of stepping on the discipline of the campaign. But they did get, they were disciplined when it came to how they spent their resources. And there's no doubt um, that that was something that, um, you know, had an impact across the board. At the same time, I think that uh, it's easy to just say, oh, well, it was about defund the police. And that's the sort of simple answer. It, it's just not, it's not that simple. I think there was a lot of things that went into this cycle. Um, you know, the Republicans had really strong local candidates. They saw what, what Democrats did in 2018 to run really strong local candidates that were very well respected, more women than before. Um, they mapped them to their district and their electorates better. And so they started in, in better footing from that standpoint. You also obviously had, in order for us to pick up 81 million votes, a lot of independents, a lot of moderate Republicans that came to support President-elect Biden. And you could see maybe some split ticket voting in a lot of these districts where you know, they wouldn't naturally vote for Democrats, so maybe they leveled out. Um, and, you know, you also saw in 18, the, the reason we did so well was in part because they were voting against Trump. In this cycle, they got to vote against Trump. And so I think that kind of changed the dynamic of how we thought saw the down ballots. But fundamentally, what we can't allow is a caricature to be built up on who we are and, and who we are as a party. And at the same time, you know, I, I said this from the start, Joe Biden will have, and, and Kamala Harris, um, will have the most progressive agenda uh, ever. And, and it's going to take all of us to get it. Yes, we've won Georgia, and that is amazing. But that still is a 50-50 Senate with, with senators that represent, um, you know, uh, some, some tougher states. So it is not going to be easy by any stretch. And it's going to be very important that we find a pathway for common ground. And that's really, I think, our task as a party and as a path forward. How do we lean in on the things we see together that we agree on and that we can get done uh, and build on that? And I think there's real opportunity to do that. Thank our you so much. Oh, thank you, Arnav. Our next questioner is Jeffrey Stewart. He's a Tufts alum, alumnus, and he's also the chairman of the Board of Advisors of Tisch College. Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Let me add my congratulations, uh, Jen, on an incredibly well-run campaign and my personal thanks for the important role you played in our democracy survival. Um, that's really not an understatement. 
Um, I will admit also that I wasn't expecting to be emotional listening to this conversation, but given the times in which we're living, hearing you really, Jen, has only raised the level of respect and admiration I have for you and as a fellow Jumbo, pride. Um, the question I want to ask is the increase in young people voting and their engagement, um, as we've talked about, has played a significant role in a number of the battleground states, uh, and that's great news. But as we all know, there's still a high level of mistrust of government and civic institutions, and that certainly has been made considerably worse over the last four years. So I'm wondering, in your opinion, which executive actions, which legislative priorities do you think are important to help restore the faith of young people in government and the notion that it can be a force for good in their lives? Yeah. Well, thank you for those kind words. And I think your question is so important. I think you know, first and foremost, we have to make sure that young people uh, see in, in, in any leadership uh, that, they, that they exist there, that they're part of it, that they're not on the outside or that they, again, you know, have to wait their turn. I, I just, you know, I think we'll fail if, if that's the feeling young people have. But that also we fundamentally understand what they're going through. It is so different than my generation and the generations before. Um, you know, the economic crisis, the 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 climate crisis, the 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 racial systemic racial and racial equity crisis uh, in this country. I mean, you know, and, and then a pandemic. And and it's hard for me to navigate being in a pandemic and the things that I've given up. But it honestly isn't the same as giving up this time as a young person. Um, you know, I can't even imagine what I would have been like if I was stuck with my parents all the time, um, when I, far beyond when I wanted to be. So I, I think, you know, for us, as, as we move forward, we need to make sure that we are not just talking to people and to young people, but they are part of what we are saying and we're listening. I think we clearly on day one, have the opportunity to right a lot of wrongs, whether it's you know all the commitments that the president-elect has made, getting back into Paris, DACA, um, ending the Muslim ban. I mean, you know, there is just a litany of pieces that you know we immediately have uh, the ability and the need to to live up to um, from what this country needs. And then you know, it is how do you how do you take Gina McCarthy, who is amazing and who I just love speaking to because of her accent and reminds me uh, of home. Um, but how, how, you know, person. Or exactly, exa that's exactly right. And has an amazing accent is the other pride. And, and every time I, I Zoom with her, I get to see like her amazing house in, um, in, uh, in Boston. And, and uh, I reflect that sometime in my life, I will be back there. But I think fundamentally what we've tried to set out to do is we've built this administration so far is how do we ensure that we have people like Gina who has created a, the entire climate office within the White House that has never existed before to make sure that there is a team of people every single day working on this and also knowing that we can't go it alone, but that we can't be in a defensive posture. We've got to be in an open, how do we bring people in and be part of the solution and, and understand how big it is? And I think the opportunity is there to show young people they don't have to just take a leap of faith. We have to prove that they have to that they could trust us. We have to prove that government works for them, but we need to do a much better job of making that connection, not the white papers of policy, but how the work that we are doing will really impact their lives and make it better, even if they don't feel it immediately on day one, um, and how all of that's interconnected. And so I think that there's a lot of work to be done here across the board. I am hopeful, especially in this time of crisis, especially as we continue in this most awful, um, you know, uh, tragedy of what we see day in and day out around COVID, um, and you know, continuing challenges coming out of the administration to take care of the American people. I think that's grounding in a lot of ways, but also gives us the opportunity to uh, solve for quickly some of the inept leadership that we saw in the previous administration move quickly to solve some of these problems to the extent that we can immediately, and then carry people on this journey with us as we try to tackle these really large systemic issues that we haven't been able to, um, and rebuild trust by making sure young people are part of the process every step of the way. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks for being with us today. Appreciate it. Uh, Jen, we can't thank you enough uh, for spending this time with us and for Returning to your alma mater, that's, that is one of the upsides of, of, of uh, doing things virtually. 
Um, let me just say to our audience, um, this is the first in the Tuff to Tisch College Distinguished Speaker Series for the second semester. Um, it's going to be hard to beat this, but we have an, inc an incredible lineup that we'll be announcing, I think, the very first week in February. So I hope everybody will stay tuned for that. And let me just say, Jen, if you were on campus with us, <clears throat> we have a habit of, of presenting a gift to the people who, who are generous enough to share time with us. And so um, we didn't want you to go away giftless. So I want to, we're going to be sending you um, a jumbo, oh, look at that. jumbo vote t-shirt. This is, ah, I this, love it. this t-shirt was made um, as part of the Tough Students campaign to increase our own, you can see you can register on the back. Look at that, Tur Tough's turbo vote. Oh, I love that. So we're going to send you, by the way, five t-shirts. <laughs> For everybody in your household. All right? I don't know if we have children's sizes, but they can grow into them. Exactly. And I just want to thank you for, um, for being with us, for, for staying connected to the university as you have. You've been, we're very proud of you, but I want to echo what Jeff said. Um, we thank you for, for, for leading us across the Red Sea, if I can put it that way. And, um, and you're going to do great things now that you're on the other side. So thank you very much and let's stay in touch. Absolutely, thank you for having me. It is always an honor to be part of Tufts and I, uh, I will carry you forward. Fair enough, go Jumbos, bye go now. Jumbos.